Envisioning the Future, and we are delighted to present J.D. Lindeberg to help us understand the challenge of garbage facing the planet. What's the problem? Huh? What turned that problem into a crisis? And what are some of the ways that we can begin to address it? J.D. has worked in the field of sustainability and material recovery for 30 years, including as president of Resource Recycling Systems based here in, a, not here in Ann Arbor, but here in Michigan in Ann Arbor. He has been at the cutting edge of efforts to adopt effective recycling programs here in Michigan and is involved with sustainability projects across the United States and in Europe. Because he is both an engineer and a public policy wonk by training, he has master's degrees from Princeton and Stanford, bachelor's from Dartmouth, he is equally comfortable in helping with the redesign of material recovery facilities or in advising public officials on recycling policies covering food waste, mixed waste, emerging technologies, compostings, and plastics on all of our minds. He has a very global perspective that is shaped by years of experiences abroad, including being a uh, volunteer in the Peace Corps in his younger years, which is a great place to start in life. So without further ado, and we will be having questions afterwards, I would like to present J.D. Lindeberg. Thank you, Karen. You, you, you organize a mean, mean mid-February get-together in a, in a cold place. So um, I'm going to put my glasses down here and put the mic uh, back here so I can run around a little bit. Um, I first came to one of these events last year at this time with a friend of mine who was lecturing on tariff policy with China. And I had no idea that I would be here speaking tonight until I got an email from the, the super organized Karen Siegel, who's, you know, obviously organized you all into the room tonight. So in, in a... In a in a time when I would have expected a lot of you to be in Florida or something. So, so, uh, so thanks for coming. This is a topic that I'm passionate about, um, something I'm very interested in. And uh, I hope to sort of tell an, a story tonight that has an arc of the local to the global and back to the local. Because I think that the, the things we're talking about, we've been talking about for a long time, but as of the last few months, I think they're getting to be more important. So I'm really excited to have a conversation with you tonight. I'm hoping to speak for 30 or 35 minutes and then have an opportunity to entertain discussion, questions, and things like that. So thanks a lot. Let's get started. The story around the current crisis in recycling started in 1995. A discussion that happened in Shanghai, China, about the terms of the loan, the development loans that were going to China for development. And in the fine print, uh, that, was, that loan language was enforcement of environmental regulations. And being environmental regulations, the agreement was that we could do those things afterwards. We could do those things at the tail end of the term of those loans. But we're going to do them. This is the Chinese speaking. So in 1995, the ban on the importation of recyclables that occurred last year was set in motion. And it was completely predictable. Shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. This is sort of annoying. I'm sorry about that. We'll change that. Hopefully everybody's all right. Is that better? OK. So that starts the part of the global story. So we're in the middle of a recycling crisis. Yes, there's a surplus of recycled product on the market right now. Consequently, sort of through basic microeconomics, the prices for those things are quite low. And there's some, there's some trouble throughout the recycling programs in the United States. But let's move ourselves to uh, something more local. Some of you might recognize these pictures behind me. Anybody got any idea? Upper Peninsula, city a lot like Traverse City. It's on a bay. Marquette. Marquette is jumping off the edge of the pool into, the, into Lake Superior, cold, cold water. 
And they're investing $6 million in a new recycling facility in the middle of the biggest recycling crisis we've heard about in the last 30 years. Why are they doing that? Well, that's a story, too. And I think it's a story that's really illustrative of the strength of recycling and why it's a good thing to invest in. They're doing it because the current program they have won't survive in today's marketplace. They sort materials into grades that aren't very good, they're not very clean. And as we'll discover tonight, that's one of the problems with what we were doing and what we were sending to China, is they weren't very clean. And because they weren't very clean, they weren't very valuable, and they looked a lot like trash. There's another reason that Marquette is doing this. They're doing it because their public opinion, when surveyed by the authority up there, which I thought was just a really remarkable idea, that the, the Solid Waste Authority went out, they operate a landfill, they went out and they surveyed the, the, the people of Marquette County and they asked them, should we invest in a single stream recycling facility? And look at the results. Not only did they overwhelmingly say yes, people who don't participate in today's recycling system were even most positive. Think about that. So they're hungry for doing something. So that's sort of a little bit of the local story. And we're going to bounce back and forth between the global and the local. And then at the very end, we're going to bring this back to some big picture issues that are important to all of us. But before we get going, let's talk a little bit about some common terms. Like any industry, we live in an industry where there's a lot of jargon. And I think there's three or four terms that it's going to make it a lot easier for you all to understand what I'm talking about if we get straight right away. First of all, how many of you, are, how many of you are, are familiar with single stream recycling? Okay, so you know that you have a big container into which you can put all of your recyclable material. Hopefully you read in the newspaper, you get your education and you know exactly what should go into that thing because we're gonna talk about that problem too, okay? But before we had single stream recycling, we had dual stream recycling. And the difference there was we had two containers. In one, we put flat things. In another one, we put two-dimensional, three-dimensional things that were rounder. Well, the flat things tended to always be paper, cardboard, things like that. And the rounder things, they tended to be cans and bottles and those kinds of things. And the reason we did that is we didn't really have good technology for separating in an automated way flat things from round things. But once we did, oh, then we moved from dual stream facilities to single stream facilities. And we like those for a variety of reasons. So dual stream, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, not much. Single stream is gonna get a lot of attention. The other thing that's gonna get attention is, is the word MRF, M-R-F, Materials Recovery Facility. It's the place, it's, the, it's that place where your things that get picked up off of the curb by that truck, that's where the truck goes. It goes to a MRF. I'll show you some pictures so you get an idea of what it is. There's single stream MRFs, dual stream MRFs. Single stream MRFs is what I'm gonna talk about tonight because they can sort the flat things from the round things, okay? That's what we're looking at. Some examples of things that happen in MRFs. I didn't show you the boring hall where they dump things on the floor and shove them with loaders into a, into a conveyor because I didn't have enough real estate on the slide for that. But what we're seeing here is two things and I want you to take two things away from this. One is modern MRFs today are very automated. Um, you use old technologies like magnetism to pull steel out and aluminum out. You use density separation to separate heavy things from light things. But because we now have this additional technology, what you can do is you can separate oh, the flat things from the round things. And so you, you run those up, those, those, those disc screens, and it, 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 it fiddles through them, and it can actually separate cardboard from newspaper, and it can get rid of the containers, it splits them into two lines. You take it over optical sorters, which you can now buy for about $110,000 a piece, and they replace a, a person. And so in the first year, you, first two years, you pay that off. You can sort out glass by color, you can sort out plastic by resin type. You can even sort cartons out of paper and things like that. But in the end, the thing that makes you have high quality product at the end is you gotta have a person there making sure at the very end that there's contamination comes out, that the big chunks that are gonna ruin those fancy optical sorters up front got pulled out, and things like that. And so one of the places that the investment 
that those re material recovery facilities need to focus on is the people. And it's really easy to cut people. But when you cut people, you get crappy product. So this is some of the, eh, not great, not awful product. You have paper bale on one side. You got plastic bale on the other. It's film plastic. Uh, number four, people who keep track of the numbers, little chasing arrows, that's number four. Um, we'll talk about that a little later. But quality is a big deal. Well, so the growth of single stream recycling, and I apologize that somehow we got the, I didn't mean to cut off the titles here, but uh, what I wanted to point out here is that we have 400 facilities, that, MRF facilities in the country right now. You can see that by 2012, more than 250 of them were single stream. That number has continued to grow, and that actually underrepresents how much single stream processing there is in the country because single stream facilities are five, six, seven, maybe even ten times bigger in capacity than the, their dual stream counterparts. You make them big, you run a lot of material through them, not necessarily here in this community because you don't have enough population, but when you big cities, you make them big. Okay? So they're the dominant thing. Why are they the dominant thing? There's a lot of conspiracy theories that you can read about and you know, learned environmental journals about how single stream is the end of humanity. Um, it's really just garbage. And, they, and they, 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 they talk about things like contamination. And those problems are real. We're gonna talk about them. But I can tell you the really big reason that we have single stream processing is that we have single stream collection. And single stream collection is a big deal. People really like their curb carts. You guys have curb carts? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty good improvement compared to the boxes you put on the ground and the wind would come up and all the recycles would blow around and you can keep them contained and it also turns out that you can get more material in there so you can recover more. But the really big thing that happens with, can anybody tell me what's the really big deal about this? What's going on here? Do you see a person? I don't see a person, right? So two things happen. First of all, nobody blows up their back by lifting 50 pounds of recyclables into the back of a truck 600 times a day. Not a good life. Pretty bad. The worst they get off of this is carpal tunnel. <laughs> okay? But the really overwhelming thing is we used to kill 50 drivers a year because they got out of the truck and the cars behind them weren't patient enough to let them get back in the truck before running them over. And that number is down to one or two. That's the reason that we run single stream right now, is because the biggest company in the world, Waste Management, decided that they weren't going to kill any more drivers. And they're not a great company from a quality of recycling perspective in some ways, but when they say it was a safety issue, I believe them, because I know a lot of people who worked there and made those decisions and invested in these, these things. So when people talk about why we move to single stream and all the problems with single stream, they don't talk about that. And to me, that's the biggest reason to do it. But there are problems. There's contamination. Oh my lord, what can you find in there? You find horses heads. You find engine blocks. Now come on, how did an engine block get in a curb container? Somebody had to work pretty hard to put it in there, just like the horse's head. All right, fortunately, you don't find them by the thousands, only a few. What you find by the thousands is dog poop. You find, even worse than dog poop, somebody thinks he can recycle an old garden hose. Can you imagine putting an old garden hose through a facility that has conveyors and axles that turn? It's a maintenance person's nightmare, all right? So why does that happen? Well, for some, for some reasons, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Some, you know, some people look at this and say, I can recycle more. Let's put more things in there. I think if I, if I put it in there, it'll just go away and somebody will recycle it, right? Well, to some degree, some of that's true. We do get more participation. We get more recovery. But you also get more contamination. So you want to put the right things in there. And some of that's on the public sector. Some of that's on the cities and the municipalities and the programs that used to educate people and send them print, you know, uh, inserts in the newspapers. You know, we don't have so many newspapers anymore, so that's harder. <laughs> Sometimes they send them in the utility bills. Sometimes they do public service announcements. What can you put in your recycling? And one of the great things about single stream recycling is you're no longer limited to the number of materials you can have. You can, you can add more. 
but you have to educate people about what belongs in there, otherwise they get confused. And when you move from Traverse City to Kalkaska, or back, or to Chicago, the kinds of materials that are accepted are different. So reasonably intelligent people get confused. Well, you can get past that by educating folks. But unfortunately, in a circumstance where we don't have enough municipal funds, it's easy to cut the two, three hundred thousand dollars of education funding that you need to have because it's not real fatal the first year. But by the fifth year, it's a big problem. So we don't educate well enough, and we got to do that. Okay? The other reason is most of the collectors are garbage companies. They have an ethic that says, if it's on the curb, get it off the curb, and move it around, move it off, because we're going to get calls. Why didn't you pick up my car? Why didn't you pick up my recycling? Well, if the recycling's got a problem, you're going to have a big residual rate, garbage rate, right? And if it's this high, 25 or 30 percent, like some of the early facilities were, then you have a really big problem. Because you send it through this expensive facility, you incur 50, 60 dollars a ton of cost, and then you take it out the back and you take the landfill for another 50 bucks. All right, that's a bad economic equation, right? Terrible economic equation. But the worst part of it is, is many of the contaminants, they make your actual recyclables worse. And so they, down value, they downgrade that value. But you can actually get to a point where you have high performing facilities in the 10%, 5%, 8% range of residual, which is pretty good. That's about the most you can expect. You're going to get some errors. You can't get perfection. Some of it is enforcement. We're reluctant to enforce. Here, not recyclable. They said they left them a do better, do better note. Don't put those things in there. Next time, don't, if you don't put that, we'll take it away. All right? So it's good, good, you know, good evidence of what you can do. Because what you need to do is you need to have high quality bales. All right? And this is the thing to get back to the global perspective, that China was cracking down on. This is a mixed plastic bale. A number of people came up to me today at the reception and while I was sitting here waiting for this to start and said, you know, we're really concerned about plastic pollution in the ocean. Where is that coming from? Is that coming from our bad recycling behavior here? What, what's happening with it? Well, to me, this is a big focus. It's an important thing. Because what we were doing for a large portion of the post 2000s, when we were telling our recycling programs, bring to me your mixed plastics, your ones through sevens. We were putting them into a baler at a material recovery facility. We were putting it on a truck in bale form. We were taking it across country to a port like Long Beach and putting them in intermodal shipping containers and putting them on a container ship. And we were taking them to China. And those are Chinese material recovery facilities. Do they look like what I showed you? Does this look like it's OSHA, OSHA compliant? No. What's really going on here is this is residual plastic from those bales we were sending over of ones through sevens. Does anybody know what those numbers mean? Number one is water bottles. Highly recyclable, PET, very valuable. Number two, HDPE, high density polyethylene. Quite valuable milk jugs, the colored, the colored laundry detergent. Number three, nobody wants number three. It's polyvinyl chloride. It's a contaminant of other resins. If you burn it, it poisons you. It's a bad idea. We shouldn't produce anything from, with it, and we definitely shouldn't put it in recycling streams if we have it. Number fours and sixes. Yeah, fairly valuable. Small quantity. Yeah, it's hard to collect in any economic, economic version. And then you've got number, seven, number five, which is polystyrene, and you know, it's foam cups, that's a problem. And number seven is not even a resin, it's just everything else. Okay? So the point I want to make is the mixed plastic, one through seven, not such a good idea. All right? We'll come back to that in a little bit here. Because, because that's one of the things that led to the crisis with China. So if you look at the timeline, you'll see that We've been worrying about waste since Athens. I can tell you that if they were worrying about landfilling waste, they were also doing some recycling because they had resources that they wanted to extract from that waste. The Japanese 
set up repulping back when paper was so valuable it was really hard to make for virgin sources, and so on and so forth until we got to uh, current times that we all rep remember, right? You know, we started with curbside in the 80s, Earth Day kind of kicked things off, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing we know, we're doing the whole single stream up here. Gotten away from the environmental movement into the industrialization of it. And then we find ourselves cruising to a point where right here, our imports to China peaked, all right? Kind of crazy. Here, the agreements and those loans started to kick in. Notification started in 2013 that we're going to start inspecting the material that's coming across. The inspections happen now at the Port of Long Beach, the Port of Seattle, the Port of New York if they're going through the Panama Canal, and loads are rejected there. The national sword, almost total rejection of anything with any residual in it. 5%, less than half a percent. There's nothing coming out of a material re recovery facility with less than half a percent contamination. Nothing. So essentially, no recyclables are going there. Over the course of three or four months, we tried Vietnam, we tried uh, Bangladesh, we tried a couple other places. That lasted for about three or four months. Basically, we're back at square one. Here's, here's so profiles of, of sorted versus unsorted material, paper, and plastic. The thing I really want you to point out here is, is that we had a brief flirtation right around 2012 with what we call mixed plastic. I've already described it to you. It's the one through sevens. And we were sending this material there, and I would say maybe a third of it got recycled. The rest of it got burned, and probably one of the, one of the least environmentally friendly op options for burning, which is a cement kiln. Lots of pollution, not much environmental control. And this is really what got us, into, got us into trouble. There was no free lunch. The recyclers, the professional recyclers working for the waste management companies were telling us, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put all, bring, bring, bring all of your plastics to us. We'll take care of them. Wasn't happening. It was a false premise. And so personally, I think that this enforcement of um, the environmental regulations is a good thing. It brings us back to a reality. It's reality-based. I couldn't resist passing up this slide because it's, this is actually kind of a fun little anecdote. 2007, <laughs> the importation of scrap steel to China skyrocketed. Anybody know why? In the Olympics. They built that thing. Remember the birdcage? Yeah, it's all steel. There was such a big sucking sound for s steel to go to blast furnaces to build the structure of that, that not only did they load these intermodal containers full of scrap steel, they threw the containers themselves into the blast furnaces. <laughs> and we had, we had a two or three year shortage of intermodal shipping containers. All to build that. But then we got past the Olympics, went back to normal. Kind of, a, kind of a, a fun story that shows how sort of interconnected you know, our, our economies are around resources. So you might say to yourself, listen, this is yet another industry we've exported. We found that it's failed. Can we do it domestically? Or is this sort of like textile manufacturing? We're just done with it. Or is this like, Automobile manufacturing and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Koreans are going to kick our butts, which only sort of turned out to be partially true. Well, the answer to that is emphatically no. So I had uh, one of the folks at my company, and we spent a lot of time doing this, and we have a big database. I had him, had him print out the locations of what I would call domestic markets for recyclables in the heartland, centered on Michigan. And if you look closely at that, there's more than 400 domestic markets in Ontario and the heartland of the U.S. that are currently seeking clean, recyclable products for their raw material stream. So do you think it's better for us to keep these materials close by in our regional economy, generate jobs and allow those manufacturers to prosper? Or should we do a crappy job of sorting them and send them to China so they go away? 
That's a rhetorical question. I think the answer is obvious, right? I knew that this story looked like this, but I didn't know it looked quite like that. That's a really good picture. Kind of cool, huh? I mean, think about it. Your recycled plastics can potentially go to Petoskey Plastics, right there in Petoskey, one of the biggest recyclers of plastics in the country. You can also send them to Revital right across the bridge in Sarnia. There's a huge cardboard mill going in in northern Ohio, Wapakoneta. Pratt Industries, they're going to make boxes for Amazon. 50,000 tons a month of recyclables go in there. 50,000, and so on and so forth. So the notion that we don't have regional markets is foolish. And the fact that we do have regional markets lends to strength for our recycling programs. California is in real trouble. They don't have markets like this to this level. And they're very, very dependent on the Asian markets. We don't have that issue. Now, I'll admit, because there's a sort of a 30% extra amount of, of, of recyclables on the market, supply and demand being what it is, the prices have plummet, plummeted. And these markets, they've taken advantage of this because they can lower their for this year or the next year, they can lower their cost of goods sold. But it'll rebound, and it'll come back to a place that's stable and is worthwhile for recycling. Yet another reason that we should be investing in this, because the economic spin-off effects of that are, are, are tremendous. So what we find is that being clean and thoughtful and investing in recycling makes a lot of sense. Couple statistics, 70% of the paper mills in the United States right now take a substantial amount of recycled fiber. 80% of all paper made in this country, feedstocks are recycled, or is, is a recycled feedstock. 90,000 tons of steel every year is made. 90 million tons, sorry. 75 million of those tons come from recycled sources, like old car bodies, things like that. The lesson is, is if we stopped recycling today magically, that'd be a big, big hurt on the economy, right? Now, the story with plastics isn't so good. 25% of, of, of water bottles are recovered, and some of our customers are the people who want to use more recycled PET for their, um, you know, their sugar water that they sell. I won't say who. And they, they want to have 50% of their, of their um, PET in those bottles. Well, there's not enough recovered right now to serve those needs. Now, the good news is they're willing to invest in the infrastructure to get there. But they can't invest in infrastructure unless it's there. So we get back to the Marquette story. Yeah, the investments they're getting are coming from places like the Closed Loop Fund that is funded by the big consumer packaged goods, $100 million of funding, $500 million of funding, because some of those big Fortune 500 companies are putting their, mouth where their, their money where their mouth is. OK, big question in the room. Climate change. I know it's a controversial subject. For me, it's clear. It's a big deal. Well, why am I talking about it? We're talking about recycling, right? Well, justification for recycling is it's all about energy savings. And really, most of our GHG emissions that contribute to climate change is about energy. And what you see behind me is a graphical depiction of the kind, it's, it's a unitless depiction of the savings that you experience by material when you recycle it. Even when you calculate the amount of energy you need to drive the truck down the street, take it to the facility, put the electricity in the facility, and put the bales on the truck, and take it to wherever it needs to go. So you can add all of that energy expenditure in, and you still save on every single commodity that we typically recycle, a substantial amount, even glass. 
which is the hardest to recycle economically, the hardest thing we recycle economically today is still a savings. It's something that's very personal for me because it's something that you can touch. And when you invest in this kind of activity, it's a practical, everyday activity that really can change the world. Well, the polls that we see make it clear that you all and me and people like us think that this is a problem. The interesting thing to me is and, and I often forget about this. Again, one of the things I enjoy about these, these talks is I spend a fair bit of time preparing for it, as Jane will point out to me, that I learn new things. And one of the things I learned about this is five times as many people think climate change has already started than don't think so. The other people are on the fence about it. Wow. That reaffirms my belief in the American electorate, in all of you, in the citizens. Where I have some questions is what our political structure thinks about it. And that's a potential problem. But again, for some of my own personal journey, I've been thinking about this. As, as, as Karen pointed out, I'm an engineer, I'm an economist, I'm a very numbers-oriented person, I'm a very data-oriented person. I believe in science. I don't think you argue about data. I don't think you argue about global warming happening any more than you argue about the world being round. And it really irritates me when I talk to people that question that. And then I realize there's a problem there. And I realized that, 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 that whatever my upbringing might be, science, my dad, the younger guy on that picture is a physicist. I grew up in a constant physics experiment, always looking at data, et cetera, et cetera. It just was my life, right? And yeah, I value that part of life. But I realized that that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for us to have this conversation and have meaningful social change. And instead, I've started to take... Um, I started to take uh, uh, a degree of, of, of comfort, I think, from some of the lessons that I've been learning from people who aren't necessarily like me. Um, and in particular, one who's shown here, Catherine Hayhoe. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, has anybody heard of her? Good for you. She's somebody that I've only recently, recently come to understand her thinking behind this. She's a very eminent climate scientist. She was one of the authors of the recent climate report that was put out the Friday after Thanksgiving by the, by the government because they wanted us to all get a chance to look at that while we were out doing Black Friday shopping. <laughs> and yet, she takes a very different perspective. And she takes a different perspective because she comes from a different background. She's an evangelical Christian married to an evangelical minister living in the heart of Texas. And she finds it compatible to be an evangelical Christian and a climate scientist and able to talk about climate change and debunk what she views as flagrant climate denial. But she doesn't do it using data. She doesn't do it using her PhD. She doesn't wield those like clubs. She, as her statement here indicates, believes in values, in human connection, and in developing a common experience around something so you can meet people where they're at. And that's been kind of humbling for me because I've spent 30, 35 years thinking that things can be, things can be um, put in an engineering equation, that they can be uh, reduced to data, and that it should be obvious, and that why aren't we turning the ship when we need to turn the ship? Well, maybe we need to rethink it, and I've, I've made that commitment myself. Because one of the things that I see in terms of success in the various environmental waves that we've experienced, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, what many people believe led to the first Earth Day and the first wave of environmentalism in modern America. Um, the energy crisis in the 70s, and I see that I'm probably younger than a few of you, so if I experienced the energy crisis, so did you, so you remember that as well. Lines at the gas stations, colder houses, Jimmy Carter wearing a sweater, giving the State of the Union address, things like that, you know, for the second one. And we thought seriously about, about energy 
energy, uh, energy consumption and megawatts. And Amory Lovins up here, and uh, this was from the Groundwork Center report that was done for Traverse City Power and Light. And Bill McDonough, a star architect who popularized cradle to cradle, third wave environmentalism around the time of the garbage barge, thinking through zero waste and closing the loop. And to something that I think we're watching happening with the Green New Deal and AOC today, which I hope turns into the fourth wave and leaves me really, really excited because we're talking about issues as pie in the sky and as outrageously naive as they might seem, we're talking about them seriously in ways that we haven't for probably since the first two years of the Obama presidency when they seriously considered carbon taxes and things like that. And that leaves me with a great deal of hope. It leaves me with the idea that if we stick to doing things like recycling here, and working through the systems to make sure that plastic waste is collected in Indonesia and Malaysia and the islands of the Indian Ocean and, and off the coast of uh, North America, that we can avoid that experience for those kids. Because that is truly a beautiful place that is now not so beautiful. And it's a shame that people have to live in that. And so we have an opportunity through our efforts here to make some really positive change because we live in an extraordinarily beautiful place that deserves our attention, and we need to recognize that it would be a real shame to let it be trashed. Thank you very much.